Hello everyone. Thank you for joining me in our ongoing series through the Book of Acts. I trust that you are enjoying the brief overview I am providing, and I hope that you are taking the time to read and meditate upon each chapter as we look at it. Let me assure you that nothing beats reading and rereading chapters and books of the Bible. No matter how well you think you know the Bible, there is always some additional insight to be found. Today we are looking at Acts chapter 11. Our reading today is Acts chapter 11 verses 1 to 3, verse 18 and verses 25 and 26. Let me read that selection for you now. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them? When they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. This is the word of the Lord. Before we examine what happens in chapter 11, let's very briefly review what happened in chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 has been rightly described as a pivotal chapter in the book of Acts. This is because it records for us how God opened wide the doors of salvation to include Gentiles. That's significant, of course, because most of us listening to this are indeed Gentiles. No longer would salvation be limited to a small ethnic group in a specific geographic region. From now on until our Lord and Saviour returns, salvation is open to all who put their faith in Jesus Christ. What a wonderful and momentous moment it was, and it comes to us through the story of a Roman soldier. Chapter 10 introduces us to the Roman centurion Cornelius. He is pictured by Luke as a pious and godly man who worshipped God, prayed without ceasing, and was charitable and generous in his giving. That's a description to which we should all aspire. As a result, Cornelius was respected and admired by the Jews, even though as a Roman soldier he represented their enemy. One afternoon at 3 p.m., he receives a vision of an angel. The angel tells him that his good works have been seen and are remembered by God. He is to summon Simon Peter from Joppa, who will tell him what to do next. Cornelius obeys what he is told and sends three men down to fetch Peter from Joppa. Meanwhile in Joppa, Peter is also having a supernatural experience. He has gone up onto the roof at midday to pray. Whilst on the roof, he falls into a trance and sees an interesting scene. A great sheet containing a wide range of creatures is lowered and raised three times from heaven. To understand what is happening here, we need to appreciate the importance the Jews placed on clean and unclean foods. They followed very strict dietary rules, which laid out what was kosher, able to be eaten, and non-kosher, not able to be eaten. God's voice comes to Peter, telling him to rise, kill and eat. As a law-abiding Jew, Peter is horrified. Like all devout Jews, he only ate what the Lord allowed. He rebukes God and reminds him that he is a law-abiding Jew. God tells him that what he has cleansed is now clean. The point that God is making here is twofold. Firstly, the Old Testament laws, particularly those surrounding food, were no longer valid or applicable. Jews were no longer bound to them. Secondly, and far more importantly, the distinctions between people that were seen in the dietary laws were also no longer valid. Gentiles who did not follow the laws were no longer to be looked down upon or considered unclean. God had made them clean and they were to be welcomed into his family. The party sent by Cornelius arrives in Joppa and Peter and his friends accompany them back to Caesarea. Here Peter preaches the gospel and as a sign that God truly welcomes Gentiles, the Holy Spirit falls upon them. The whole group is baptised, and Peter spends some time staying with them. 
I should point out before moving on the timeline of these events. The impression we might get from Luke's account is that all the things that we are reading about took place in quick succession, over a number of weeks or months. In actual fact, the conversion of Cornelius and his household takes place about ten years after Pentecost. Now we might imagine that the inclusion of Gentiles into God's family was a cause for great celebration. But as we will see in chapter 11, not everyone was happy about this development. In chapter 11, three main events are highlighted. Firstly, Peter is challenged for his association with Gentiles. Secondly, Barnabas and Saul minister in Antioch. And thirdly, the prophet Agabus predicts a famine. We will look at each event in turn. The first event, then, is that Peter is challenged. The news of what has happened in Caesarea soon gets back to the other Christians in Jerusalem. When Peter arrives, he is confronted by his fellow Jewish Christians. They are deeply troubled that Peter had broken Jewish cultural traditions and taboos by eating with Gentiles. This concern is expressed in their challenge to him. You went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them? Sharing a meal together was a special act of fellowship in the ancient world. To visit someone's house and break bread with them signified a special bond or relationship. The problem was since Gentiles did not follow the strict laws of the Jews regarding food, it was simply impossible for Jews to eat or even socialise with them. So in their eyes Peter had done a terrible thing and compromised his faith. Now it's very easy for us to be critical of this legalistic and strict way of thinking. We of course have the benefit of having the whole New Testament to learn from and as a consequence we much better understand the relationship between Lord and Gospel. But to appreciate why the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem were so upset we need to try and put ourselves in their situation. They had grown up in a culture that held Gentiles to be unclean and impure. As a result, they lived separate lives and tried not to have contact with them. It would take time for them to make the transition from shunning Gentiles to welcoming them, welcoming them as full Christian brothers. Peter stands before them to make his defence. They may have heard various rumours or parts of the story, so Peter gives them the whole if somewhat a bridge story from his perspective. He does not deviate very much from the events that we previously read about in chapter 10. As I often say, when things are repeated in the Bible, it means that they are very important and that we are to take note. As Peter concludes his account, he tells them about how the Holy Spirit fell upon Cornelius in his household. This act served as God's stamp of approval it was God demonstrating that these people now properly and fully belonged to him. It was the very same gift that the apostles had received in the upper room on Pentecost. Peter's point was clear to all his hearers. There is now no distinction between God's treatment of the Jews and the Gentiles. If God makes no distinction, then neither should we. Peter's speech ends with this statement. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? How did the Jewish Christians respond? Firstly, we are told that they became silent. Their arguments against Peter, Peter had been answered. Secondly, convinced by Peter's words, they began to glorify God. They are glorifying God for now making the possibility of salvation and eternal life through Jesus Christ open to both Jews and Gentiles. From now on the church would comprise both Jews and Gentiles. However, this earth-shattering revelation would take some time to be fully accepted, and as we will see later on, issues will resurface. Barnabas and Saul in Antioch the action shifts now from what was happening in Jerusalem to some of the early missionaries from the Jewish church. This theme of the growth and expansion of the church into the Gentile world will be Luke's focus for the remainder of Acts. As we saw back in chapter 8, following Stephen's death, Christians began to be persecuted. 
As a consequence, many Jewish Christians moved away from Jerusalem and preached the gospel message to other Jews as they went. Luke tells us they travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch. However, more significantly, a number of these men, originally from Cyprus and Cyrene, began to preach to Gentiles in Antioch in Syria. There are two cities called Antioch mentioned in the Bible, so don't get this one mixed up with Antioch Pisidia, which we read about in Acts chapter 13. Antioch in Syria, which is now in modern day Turkey, was a very important city in the ancient world. It was the third largest Roman city after Rome and Alexandria, and was a cosmopolitan mix of Romans, Greeks and Jews. This made it an important cultural and trading centre, and also the ideal place to take and share the gospel. The men who had taken the gospel to Antioch had enjoyed great success. We are told that the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Now news of a growing and thriving church in Antioch soon reached the apostles in Jerusalem. Naturally they wanted to verify the gospel's impact and to see for themselves what was happening. We saw the sim a similar response when the gospel reached and took root in Samaria. This time they sent Joses, now only known by his nickname Barnabas. Even though he was not an apostle, he was the perfect choice. He was a man, we are told, full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Also of importance was his family background. He was from Cyprus, and so he knew about Greek and Roman culture. It's also important to note what we know about his character. His nickname Barnabas means son of encouragement. He possessed a very positive nature and was recognised as being a great encourager. Now we often now underestimate or devalue the importance of positive encouraging people. But that's a big mistake. We all need positive and encouraging brothers and sisters in the faith around us. When Barnabas arrives, he finds that God is working mightily in the Christians in Antioch. He praises God and encourages the Christians to keep faithfully preaching Christ. Barnabas, though, noted a particular need in the growing church in Antioch. In order to grow or mature in the faith, Christians need not only encouragement, but also instruction. We might liken it to a sport. You might feel a little better playing golf if I applauded every shot that you took, and told you what a great golfer you were. However, in order to really get better at golf, you need guidance and instruction from an expert coach. Barnabas knew that the Christians in Antioch needed an expert coach. Who could he get? Barnabas's first choice is Saul. He is the perfect candidate. We know that he was a Hebrew who knew all the rituals and traditions of rabbinical Judaism. We also know that he was a Greek by culture, a Hellenistic Jew, and he was also a Roman citizen. Now remember that Saul had been back in Tarsus for close to ten years. What had he been doing? The truth is that we do not really know. It's very likely that he was involved in teaching and preaching and other ministry work. He was, after all, given the task of, by God of evangelising the Gentiles. Barnabas leaves Antioch to go to Tarsus, about a 144 kilometre journey, to find Saul. Eventually he finds Saul and they return to Antioch. When there we are told that they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. This arrangement lasted for one year. Luke also gives us another interesting fact here. It was in Antioch that followers of Christ were first called Christians. It often surprises people to learn that the term Christian only appears three times in the Bible, in Acts 11, 26 and 1 Peter chapter 4, and on each occasion Christians did not use it of themselves. In Latin, the ending ian meant the party of, so a Herodian, for example, was a member of Herod's party. A Christian was of the party of Jesus Christ. It signified one who belonged to and is loyal to Jesus Christ. I hope that you boldly claim the term for yourself. The third and final event then is the story of the prophet Agabus. Chapter 11 ends by telling us about the prophet Agabus. 
Agabus prophesied a severe famine that would impact the whole Roman Empire. This prophecy was fulfilled during the reign of Emperor Claudius, who reigned from 41 to 54 AD. We know from history that a, that a severe famine struck Judea from 46 to 48 AD. The church in Antioch, guided by Barnabas and Saul, gathered and sent relief to their brothers and sisters in Judea. Things to think about. I have three things for us to consider drawn from today's passage. Firstly, the danger of legalism. Many of the Jews in Peter's day were legalists. They had been conditioned to think that salvation came through the careful and precise following of rules. Over time, the rules had become more important than what really should be important, namely the relationship we have with God. Today, I'm unhappy to say that legalism is alive and well. It might be seen in the importance people put on traditions, personal preferences, or even our own personal opinions. There are churches, for example, who only use the King James Version of the Bible, and look down upon and consider other churches as heretical for not using this particular Bible version. Other churches impose strict rules on appearance, conduct or behaviour, which are not based on scripture, but only on church tradition. Too often our legalistic thinking creates barriers, divisions and mistrust. Let us then try to be open to areas of legalism in our lives. Secondly, being like Barnabas. Luke paints such a warm picture of Barnabas, a man who was positive, encouraging, and tried to see the best in other people. Life at times is hard, difficult and challenging. At the moment we are living through what seems to be a never-ending pandemic. So now is the time, if ever, to try and follow Barnabas' example. People need positivity and encouragement. So let us then try, with our family and friends, to be more like Barnabas. And finally, giving like the early church. The Christians in Antioch had probably never met the Christians in Judea. However, they recognised their need and desired to lovingly help them. What a wonderful and joyful thing it is to give to others in the faith. Often we can be selfish or narrow-minded in our aid to others. We like to help other people but only other people that we know or who we think are like us. However, when we give generously, particularly to those that we do not know, we demonstrate our unity and love in Christ. So I'd ask you now to think, who can you bless today with your giving? Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him. You went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning. I was in the city of Jabba praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who said to him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as upon us at the beginning, 
Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Now, those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. And Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And in these days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. 